I'll never forget when I was in college, I was taking nutrition counseling class as a dietetic student. I remember my professor, she's still one of my favorite dietitians in this world. Her name is Rachel Clark. And she made a comment in this class and she said, imperfect eating is normal and it's healthy. And in my head at the time, I thought, yeah, yeah, enjoy a cookie, everything in moderation, balance. But that statement never really hit until years later when I discovered intuitive eating. Today, we are going to talk about what intuitive eating is, what it's not, and how it can, I don't want to be dramatic. I'm so honest how intuitive eating can change your life. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist, a certified intuitive eating counselor, and I've been using this model in my private practice for over five years. And what that means to you is you can trust that when we talk about this topic on the podcast, it is legit and not just more diet information in disguise. So you can have clarity in your wellness journey to make the decisions around your health that feel right to you. If you're new here, you're just stumbling upon intuitive eating, welcome. Our mission is to empower women specifically to overcome their need to measure success to the numbers and start owning that strength and confidence from within. We help women with a history of disordered eating and exercise obsession find that fierce food freedom and body confidence. And we do this through heart-centered, evidence-based, one-on-one and group nutrition counseling that utilizes the fundamental principles of intuitive eating and mindful movement. We also deliver free educational content via social media, our weekly newsletter, and of course, the Fit Friends Happy Hour podcast, which is also now on YouTube. If you want weekly non-diet inspiration, recipes, and more, go to katiehake.com forward slash newsletter. Why intuitive eating? Why are we talking about it? Why is this even a thing? And I want to start by unpacking disordered eating. People hear about eating disorders and many people think, that's not me. I don't have an eating disorder. Disordered eating refers to a wide range of really irregular eating behaviors that may not fit the criteria for a specific eating disorder, but are still problematic. Disordered eating can involve patterns of eating that are unhealthy, such as restrictive eating, binge eating, or even just an excessive focus on food and weight. Disordered eating can also include preoccupations, thinking a lot about dieting, about exercising a lot or other behaviors that are aimed at actually controlling your weight. And the sad truth about disordered eating is that if we don't address these behaviors, these disordered behaviors, it can down the road, months, weeks, even years later, it can lead to a more severe eating disorder. In fact, 9% of the U.S. population or 28.8 million, let that number sink in, 28.8 million Americans will have an eating disorder in their lifetime. As I was re- researching for this episode, I settled upon a statistic that a 2023 study estimated that 22% of children and adolescents worldwide show disordered eating behaviors. And eating disorders have the second highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness behind the opiate addiction. Like, what? That is an alarming statistic. This is food. This is something we each encounter every single day. And despite that statistic, despite it being the second highest mortality rate, The fact that individuals with higher body weight actually have a two and a half times greater chance of engaging in disordered eating behaviors compared to those with a normal weight. And those patients receive a clinical diagnosis of an eating disorder about half as frequently as patients with normal weight or underweight. That's a whole nother podcast episode in itself. The toll of an all or nothing mindset can really be so heavy on the mental health, the physical well-being. And I am so passionate because now that I know this information, knowing what I know now, I look back and I look around at the fitness industry in my own history, and I am just blown away, even still today, at how many of these disordered behaviors are just normalized. And so it's no wonder that People just walk around with disordered eating and it seems normal and people don't identify with having a problem. We also know that the fear of weight gain, feeling 
like you're overeating, feeling guilty, thinking about dieting, this desire to be thin, to be smaller, all of these things are actually predictive of eating disorder severity. Of course, part of this is genetic. No one chooses to have an eating disorder, but I believe so strongly in practicing as a clinician from the intuitive eating lens, because I know firsthand for myself and working with clients in practice, it can help reduce that risk and just provide a better quality of life because isn't that what we all want? What is intuitive eating? Intuitive eating is by definition, a self-care eating framework that integrates instinct, emotion, and rational thought. And it was created by two dietitians, Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch in 1995. So it's nothing new. Intuitive eating is a weight-inclusive, evidence-based model with a validated assessment scale, meaning we can produce evidence that this practice, that this lens, this framework actually works. And there are over 200 studies to date at the time of this recording that support the efficacy of this practice. Although it's become very trendy, intuitive eating, you maybe see it a lot in social media and even on the news, and I even see podcasts about it. It's not a fad. It is not just relying on those internal cues instead of tracking macros or calories to reach your performance goals. Eating intuitively and intuitive eating are not the same, if that makes sense. Intuitive eating is the therapeutic framework, whereas eating intuitively simply refers to just tuning in to your internal body cues. Intuitive eating is not a non-diet approach to weight loss. Programs like Noom or even just I see a lot of people on social media, health coaches, nutritionists that use the language, but intuitive eating, how it was designed by the creators, the, you know, the evidence-based practice of it does not use it as a tool for weight loss. Because if it is promoted and tied to controlling your weight, it's not intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is not the same as mindful eating. I like to think of intuitive eating as an umbrella. And mindful eating is kind of falls underneath the umbrella. It's, it's one tool. It's one technique within the entire practice. And on the flip side, even though I shared that intuitive eating is not used as a tool to control your weight, intuitive eating is not anti-weight loss. I work with many clients who come to me seeking weight loss, and that's totally fine. Like they can have their own goals, like their body, not mine. But the point is we don't focus on it. It goes on the back burner. We focus on all the other habits, behaviors, the beliefs that it comes to food versus focusing on that number itself. Intuitive eating is a really a personal and it's a very dynamic process that includes 10 principles. The first principle is rejecting the diet mentality, just recognizing that diets do not work. I'm not going to subscribe to that idea that I'm going to eat less in order to be healthy. The second principle is honoring your hunger. So actually acknowledging and getting in tune with those cues and responding to those hunger cues. The third principle is making peace with food. So putting all foods on a level playing field, not looking at foods as good versus bad. Food is just food. The fourth principle is challenging the food police. That's like that annoying little voice in your head that tells you, oh, good job, you ate a salad today, or oh, you shouldn't have eaten that. That's got a lot of calories. It's got a lot of carbs. That would be the food police. And so it's learning to identify that voice in our head and talk back to it and just what's the truth? What matters to me? What doesn't matter to me? What things do I want to hold on to? And what things do I want to let go of? The fifth principle is discovering the satisfaction factor. It's like eating what you actually want. I know, revolutionary, but when we eat foods that we actually enjoy, we're going to be more satisfied. We're not going to continue to seek food because we, we're satisfied. We're, we're at peace. We're, we're good. The sixth principle of intuitive eating is feeling your fullness. So on the flip side of hunger, right? Eating when you're hungry, acknowledging those cues, identifying when do you feel full? What's that sweet spot where you feel full, you feel satisfied, but you don't feel uncomfortable? And that is, it sounds so foundational. But I find working with clients that simply acknowledging those cues, knowing when they're hungry, stopping when they're full, they've gotten so disconnected from years of dieting that it's really hard to even identify those foundational biological body cues. The seventh principle of intuitive eating is coping with your emotions with kindness. Emotional eating 
is normal. It's, it's a part of who we are, what we do as humans, but is it your only tool in your toolbox? It's focusing a lot on self-care and how we take care of ourselves as a whole. Food can be a part of it, but it's not the only aspect. The eighth principle is respecting your body, recognizing that I'm not going to be the size that I was in high school and my body is meant to change and that's okay. And I can respect it and I can be kind to it where it's at right now. I don't have to wait until I'm at a certain size or I don't have to punish it for what I ate. It's just really appreciating where you're at, acknowledging it. it's not saying you have to love your body, but can you respect? We all have people in our lives who we may not like them. Maybe you're thinking of that coworker, that family member, you don't really like them. You're just, you're going to be civil and you're going to respect them with the kindness and the dignity that they deserve because they're human. The ninth principle is movement, feeling the difference, exercising and moving your body because it feels good. Moving, recognizing that not every day has to be structured exercise, doesn't have to be structured activity. You can just do things that feel good and, and listen to your body. And that might mean going for a walk. It might mean just playing with your kids one day. It might mean going to a group fitness class. It might mean lifting heavy weights or training for a race, but it's not the end all be all. And the 10th principle is honoring your health with gentle nutrition. Remember at the end of the day, I always have to remind clients, like I am a dietitian. I very much value nutrition and the impact that it has on our health. Absolutely. That's so important. But we put that last because if I were to just give a client a list of nutrition education and information, they might turn it into a diet. And so once we get through most of those principles, again, it's dynamic. It's not step one, two, three, four, five. We have and flow and they all integrate and there's a lot of crossover and gray area, but they can get to a place where they can recognize these are my values around health. This is what I value around nutrition. For example, my grandmother passed away of Alzheimer's disease. And so for me, that's really important when it comes to my health and take care of me and longevity. And so if I can see that there's certain foods that can impact my brain health, you better believe I'm going to prioritize those foods and think about ways or learn ways that I can integrate them into my normal pattern. These 10 principles really help you to cultivate what we call attunement, that connection, that really tuning into the physical sensations in your body so you can respond to them and meet your needs, whether that's physically or whether that's mentally. The principles help remove obstacles and things that maybe disrupt that attunement or make it hard to hear those cues. And these obstacles typically come in our thoughts, our deep ingrained beliefs, our rules around foods, rules around fitness, rules around our bodies. The process of intuitive eating, it's a practice. It honors both your physical health, your mental health, and it is aligned with health at every size. You may have heard of that before. We've talked about that on the podcast because the pursuit of intentional weight loss, meaning like I am going to lose weight. I am being very intentional. I'm doing everything that I can to shrink that number. That's a failed paradigm. It creates health problems, including weight stigma, weight cycling, meaning you lose weight, you gain weight, you lose weight, you gain weight. Research shows that is very harmful to the body. And ultimately, like we talked about at the beginning of this episode, eating disorders. All bodies deserve dignity and respect regardless of the size or shape. Some of the common fears or concerns around intuitive eating is you know, I'm just going to eat junk food all day. When in reality, giving yourself permission to eat will actually result in a more balanced eating pattern. Studies show that intuitive eaters have a wider variety of food intake. They actually eat more fruits and vegetables. We'll, we'll talk more about that in another episode. Another concern is that, well, if I have a health concern, maybe I have di diabetes, maybe I have prediabetes, or I have PCOS, or I have GI issues, that I can't do intuitive eating. And the reality is that we focus on more than just nutrients and calories. So you actually can do this while addressing a health concern from the nutrition lens. Another fear that I see commonly when I talk to potential clients is that, well, I'm just never going to stop eating. Intuitive eating sounds great, but I would never stop. And that's just not true. 
restriction is one of the biggest drivers to eating uncontrollably. And when you remove restriction and you eat regularly in a way that satisfies, you actually rebuild trust with your body with those cues. A lot of clients are concerned that I need to lose weight because I'm overweight and I'm unhealthy. And we're not going to dig too deep into the weight science here, but much of the evidence on the associations of weight and health is correlational, meaning, yes, there's a relationship, but one does not cause the other. A high weight does not cause X, Y, Z. So for example, weight loss is often associated with increased movement or increased fruit and vegetable consumption. So was it the weight loss that led to health improvements or was it the lifestyle changes? Or maybe a combination of both. You may know someone who lives in a smaller body, who smokes a pack of cigarettes a day and has liver disease. Just because that person is smaller does not make them healthier. Just like I have clients who live in larger bodies and they run marathons with perfect lab work. The reality is when it comes to health, it is not black and white. It is much more complex and nuanced. So intuitive eating focuses on the whole person, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the social determinants of health, rather than one uncontrollable factor, aka your body weight, that may or may not improve your health. Takeaway for you today is that intuitive eating, it's a journey. It's not a destination. It can feel lonely, but it doesn't have to be. If you're someone who says you've tried it, it didn't work, or maybe you read the book, it's great for others, but it didn't work for me, it's likely because, number one, we either turned these principles into rules. Number two, you don't fully trust your body yet. Number three, maybe you still have some of that diet mentality to work through. Or number four, you just don't have support. I would love for you to DM me on Instagram at KT Hank or at Fit Friends Happy Hour. And let me know what your biggest takeaway was today. Whether you're brand new to this concept, you like need a helmet because your mind is blowing or you're along this journey, but maybe you heard something today that just clicked with you in another way. I would love to hear where you're at, wherever you are at on your journey.